November 1915. While Imperial Japan navigated through World War I, winter was settling in around the small hamlet of Rokusensawa Sankebetsu, a homely village located roughly 18 miles inland from the west coast of Hokkaido Island. As the last leaves fell and the first snowfalls of the season blanketed the forest floor, the members of this small community were no doubt preparing for another long, cold, and snowy season. The village was newly settled and still extremely wild. Villagers in those days faced no small share of hardships and were no stranger to facing the wild animals of the region. What they didn't know, however, was that deep in the forest near the town, something deadly had awoken. Something that would cement this winter in this town forever in the country's nightmares. The Osuri brown bear is one of the largest types of brown bear, reaching sizes which can rival the famous Kodiak bear. They are by far the largest predators on the island of Hokkaido, and as such can eat and kill any prey, although much of their diet is vegetarian. Like in most places, humans are generally too much trouble to kill and eat, but this has not stopped Osuri bears from attacking people in the past. Between 1900 and 1957, it is reported that 141 people were killed by brown bears on the island. Seven of these would happen in just two days in 1915. Sometime in mid-November, a large Usuri brown bear showed up at the house of the Ikeda family in Rokusen Sawa. Though this encounter was harmless and the bear took only some harvested corn, it was unusual because most bears should have been in hibernation by this point in the winter. It is now believed that the uncharacteristic behavior of this bear was due to it being woken early from hibernation due to hunger, making it a bear without a hole in Japanese terminology. On November 20, the animal reappeared at the house. Fearing for the safety of his horse, the head of the family organized a small party to wait for the bear's return. Ten days later, the bear reappeared, and the small group managed to shoot it but not kill it. Believing the bear would now fear humans and thus stay away from settlements, they considered the effort a success. It was not. Three weeks later, on the morning of December 9th, the bear appeared at the Ota family farm. Present were Abe Mayu, the farmer's wife, and Hasumi Mikio, an unrelated baby she was taking care of. Upon entering the home, the bear killed baby Mikio with a bite to the head. Abe Mayu put up a struggle, but was ultimately knocked down and dragged into the forest, never to be seen alive again. Early the next morning, a search party, some 30 men strong, set out to hunt the killer bear. They entered the forest and had walked no more than 150 meters before meeting it face to face. Five men fired upon the animal, but only one hit his mark and the animal retreated. Searching around the area, the men found blood in the snow at the base of a fir tree. Under the snow was the corpse of Abe Mayu. Only her head and legs remained. Having now gotten a taste of human flesh, the villagers were certain that the bear would return. It did so that same night, coming right back to the scene of the crime at the Ota farm. The main group of guardsmen, now some 50 strong, had been stationed at the neighboring Miyuki house, and as such, only one man managed to get a shot at the beast before it retreated. The group marched off into the forest down the Sankebetsu River, attempting to follow the bear. Unbeknownst to them, however, they had completely lost the trail. Back at the Miyuki house, the only people present were now women and children, with a single guardsman remaining at the door. Miyuki Yeo, the wife of the house, was preparing a meal when she heard a rumbling outside. Before she could even investigate, the bear broke through the window and had entered the house. Yeo attempted to flee, but was tripped by her second son, Yujiro, who, in panic, had clung to his mother's legs. The bear then attacked her and bit her fourth son, Umekichi, as he clung to her back. The guardsman, hearing what was happening, ran into the house where the bear released the woman and child and turned to him clawing at his back as he attempted to hide behind the furniture. Yeo and Umekichi managed to escape alive. 
In the chaos, the oil lamp and fire at the stove were both extinguished and the house was plunged into darkness. The bear continued its assault, fatally wounding two children and biting one more, before finally killing Saito Take, a pregnant woman and the mother of two of the boys who had just been attacked. The villagers later testified that they could hear Take pleading with the bear to eat only her head and not her belly for the sake of the unborn child. The fetus was later recovered alive, but died shortly afterwards. The group of men who had tracked the bear downriver finally realized their mistake, far too late. As they returned to the village, Miyuki Yeo, having narrowly escaped death, met them and frantically related the news of what had happened. They approached the Miyuki house, bear still inside, and waited at the door. As the animal stepped out into the winter night, the men had a clear chance to end its reign of terror then and there. However, they had all bunched up behind one man at the front, and, not wanting to shoot him, the large majority did not fire their guns, while the man at the front's gun misfired. The bear escaped. As the men entered the house under torchlight, there was nothing left to do but examine the grisly aftermath. On the next day, December 11th, two men returned who had both left the village after the initial attack on December 9th. The first was Saito Ishigoro, the husband of Saito Take. Unaware that he had by now lost one son, his wife, and an unborn child to the bear. The second was Miyuki Yasutaro, husband of Miyuki Yeyo, who had also lost a son. Yasutaro was returning from a visit to Yamamoto Heikichi, a renowned bear hunter. Heikichi had by then sold his gun for alcohol and refused to help, but identified the bear as Kesagake, meaning the diagonal slash from the shoulder. This beast had already been blamed for the deaths of three women. By December 12th, news of the attack had reached the Hokkaido government. The Hoboro Branch Police Station organized a six-man sniper team with guns and villagers from neighboring towns, and by that evening, the team had traveled to Rokusen Sawa. Along with them was Yamamoto Heikichi, who had by now been convinced to lend his help. The team decided that the best way to lure the bear in would be by using the corpses of his victims, a plan heavily resisted by their families. Ultimately, however, they agreed that it was best for the future of their village. That night, the team waited inside a house with the dead bodies. Kesagake approached the door, but, apparently sensing danger, immediately turned round and disappeared into the forest. It did not reappear that day, and the plan ended in failure. On December 13th, the team decided to widen their search area and realized that Kesagake was now making his way downstream. Realizing that this could lead him to other villages, they decided to wait at a bridge for the eventual arrival of the bear. Late that night, a sniper caught a glimpse of a shadow flickering in between the tree stumps on the far shore. Believing it to be a man, the police captain called out to it, but no response came. The captain gave the command to open fire, and under a spray of bullets, the shadow retreated into the forest. The next morning, the team investigated the area across the river. There, they found bloody bear tracks, confirming that they had hit their target. With impending snowstorms threatening to cover the tracks, Yamamoto Heikichi and a local guide immediately set off to track the bear, as Heikichi believed a two-man team would be faster. The men found Kesagake, wounded and resting at the base of an oak tree, and Heikichi finally finished him off with one shot to the heart and one to the head. The ordeal was finally over. As the men dragged the bear back to the village, an extremely violent snowstorm arose and continued for several hours. Believing it to be a result of the bear's death, the villagers dubbed it Kuma Arashi, the bear storm, a phrase which later became the title of two novels and a play written about the incident. Kesagake was measured at 340 kilograms, 749 pounds, and 2.7 meters, 8 feet, 10 inches tall. The villagers kept the bear's skull and some fur, but these were eventually lost to time. 
The final casualty of the incident was the village of Rokusen Sawa itself, as after such a horrible tragedy, the villagers quickly began to leave, turning the area into a ghost town. Today, there remains only a shrine which reconstructs the events of the incident. It contains multiple period-accurate houses along with a life-size statue of Kesagake towering over a fence, and another breaking through the wall of a house. Overgrown by trees and constantly dim even on the sunniest of days, the shrine stands in silent remembrance of those who lost their lives during that fateful winter all those years ago.